Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Welcome listeners to another episode and thank you for being with us. Today I am thrilled to have Grant Gary, the director behind the grief documentary, meet me where I am. And also joining us is John Farley, an actor and comedian who shares his grief story in the film. Other members are Anthony Rapp, Julie Shaw and grief expert David Kessler. And I am beyond thrilled to be bringing you glimpses from behind the scenes into this award-winning documentary, one that aims to normalize discussions around grief. Now, listeners, Grant did warn me before we were live that we may be in for a wild ride. You see, John loves to inject humor into the conversation. So now I'm warning you, dear listeners, this isn't our usual interview, but I hope you will get lots of nuggets as we continue the discussion and that you'll stay to the end as we have a special moment for you as we wrap up the episode. Without further ado, I'm going to let You both introduce yourself to our listeners so they can get a glimpse into who's behind the camera and in front of it and learn a little bit more about you. Who'd like to go first? I'll I'll go. I, uh, yes, I'm Grant Gary, um, filmmaker, actor, um, and singer, as we were previously discussing. Um, I directed the film Meet Me Where I Am and um conducted all the interviews and it's been uh quite a quite a journey that we've been on and i'm grateful that john um has been a part of it why thank you grant that's so nice of you i'm john farley all you listeners out there and i am a buddy of grants that uh uh grant and my wife did a small community theater of sweeney todd together and that's how we were introduced um and we uh have gone um we've been friends uh for since then for about five six years grant had this project coming up and i happened to just have a brother who passed away uh not just passed away it's been a while now uh he was chris farley a famous actor um i also do acting uh and voiceovers and whatever else i can get my hands on i suppose uh and so when grant came up with this uh concept of uh understanding grief or uh helping people with grief i i said certainly i would help out Uh, i don't know how well i can help out i'm not a professional grief counselor but i um sadly you don't have to be grief comes to everybody (laughs) which is which is the uh too bad it creeps into everybody's lives uh one way or another uh, so, uh, I just, um, explained to, uh, uh, in Grant's, uh, movie, uh, how I dealt with grief and usually it's through humor and I usually try and mask my feelings, swallow them deep, deep down inside of me and release them <laughs> at inappropriate times, like at soccer referees or football games that, uh, no, I, uh, usually, um, uh, yeah, I try to uh, mask my, uh, my grief, but you, you can't, it's always there. And, uh, you just, um, you know, after a while you, you smile on it and, and you uh, wish the best for uh, the people of past um, with your lives in your lives, and that's how I deal with it. So I, I I pretend they're still here and listening, you know, 
in the heavens down on us and and uh I try to make them laugh. Yeah. I really appreciated that comment when I because I I actually was privileged to uh get a sneak peek at the the movie in its entirety because I feel grief is such a heavy heavy subject and to me it's the body's way of lightening the load if you like by bringing in humor and I introduce this to my clients very early on that it's okay to laugh it's to me it's all part of the the grief journey so thank you for making it present as we yeah thanks yeah I know I'm really curious Grant uh, before we get really into it Mm. it opens up with a train and I'm curious to know the significance of it. Mm-hmm. So we had been um toying around with different like themes to appear throughout the film to sort of cut to some, you know, B-roll to show. And um the opening line is I felt like a train was pulling out of the station. And I wanted to run alongside it and have a look, or I don't know. And um, so we thought about that for a bit. And James, my filmmaking partner, um, discussed that with me. And we talked about it, and we liked that. And we weren't sure exactly if we were going to keep going with that. But then we ended up getting some footage of trains, and we thought, like, it is kind of a nice um, analogy, sort of like a symbol that when you're on, when you're in grief, you're going through this, you're going through life and you're, you know, looking out the window and seeing different things at different times. And perhaps you're seeing the same things, but they have new meaning now, you know, and it is just kind of this, this journey that, that you go on. And so there was, sort of that symbolism there with you know you're on a train and and you're on a journey somewhere and you don't know where perhaps in grief of course um i don't think there's really a destination however when it comes to grief um so that was kind of the uh uh reasoning behind the train plus i think trains are kind of cool to look at <laughs> 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 well, I wasn't too sure because there's so many metaphors people bring up, don't they? Yeah. When they're referring, I felt untethered. I felt like a boat being tossed in a storm. I mm. felt unmoored and a whole other slew. So I wasn't too sure if it was something you had felt, but I thought it it sort of wove together the entire. Well, and, movie. and we're we're also you know the 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 people in the film are from all over the place they live in different areas they the, um different states and and they all of their stories are different too so and it was really important for me to have different people with different backgrounds tell their their individual stories so it's almost like you know the audience is kind of going on the train with us and now we're stopping at this story and then we yeah. stop at this story and then we stop at the next person's story. So there's there's that element of it too that I I wanted I wanted the audience to feel like we were going somewhere together because oftentimes, um, especially when it's uh you know it's a very uh, talking head heavy documentary, and so I wanted um, and it's it's you have to be really delicate when you're editing that because you want to feel like you're going somewhere. Um, and not just at the same place at the end as you were at the beginning. So um, hopefully hopefully that's conveyed a little bit in this uh, final product. Yeah, absolutely. Did the, John, did it give you that sort of feeling when you watched it? I'm sure you've seen it many, many times that you yes. were on the train with everyone. Uh, in the movie, I did. I did feel that way. And when it happened, it more felt like a, a, a fire I had to put out <laughs> in the very beginning. And I was like, ah, I'm terrified. Uh, and then uh, after a while, uh, yes, it turns, it does turn into it. Uh, grief is a, a journey, that's for sure. 
and you have to uh navigate through and and uh yeah you you find i find uh i changed uh um well yeah i changed a lot uh, as far as i moved i, I moved out from uh Cal- chicago to california and uh um i thought i i you know i i went to i worked out every morning i ate breakfast with my other brother kevin and then uh we all went to eight o'clock mass in the mornings so that helped me uh get through because i always had kevin there with me and we uh hung out together and we wrote a movie together and so that was kind of fun uh uh, at least to be able to have somebody that's going through the exact same process with you uh throughout that whole journey so that was kind of nice to uh, be able to be on grant's train uh with uh another sibling uh Although you know, yeah, it, it there were different situations because I was the one who I was the one who had to uh, be in Chicago with Chris on that uh, on that day, uh, and Kevin flew in from uh, Los Angeles when we all and we met at O'Hare Airport uh, and then went up flew up to Wisconsin, and so that was uh, I was I just couldn't wait I was all by myself so I couldn't wait in like the uh, I had to go into like a different section of the airport. Because there was too many, too many, uh, my face, everything was all over the news. So I was like, uh, they put me in like they, uh, some back room of uh, United Airlines, which was very nice of them. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's when I, I just sat there and waited for Kevin to get to arrive. And then we went up and, uh, but for the rest of that year, it was, you know, my dad was very different. He passed away a year later because I think he was a very, uh, uh, grief stricken. Uh, uh, so, uh, he, um, he passed away a year later. So that was tough. Yeah. We had to go back to Wisconsin. Oh, I can't imagine what that must've been like for you here. You were sort of doing the movie and recounting or reliving your brother, Chris's death. Yes. A year later. Did you learn anything through the film that helped you navigate your dad, dad? Nothing. Absolute. No, I was kidding, Anne. Of course <laughs> I did. I learned, uh, yeah, my goodness, Grant found some very smart people. Uh, uh, I learned that I, um, I don't know. I learned that you can, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a Rhodes Scholar or a simple fellow like uh, myself, uh you you're gonna get through the grief you, you have to you, you just one step at a time you just keep going along the line and but you've got to uh and it's like you it, it's like you you have to handle it because it's right in front of you and it's it's grappling you and you're like oh my gosh i gotta deal with this i can't it, it, you know it's it's they're like a pair of shoes you can't go out of the house without them so you can't go around barefoot so you you wear them, put them on, and and you have to you figure out how your life is going to be with this uh, new situation, and so that's how it is. That's just basically how it is. And uh, um, I don't know. I think we were brought up well enough uh, th- that uh, we didn't make it turn us angry we we uh we had uh quite a bit of uh we all grew up catholic so we know that uh there's a better place at least we had religion in our in our in our any religion was good um and then there's some people that just say the lights just go out i don't know about those i'm just kidding those are fine folks but uh i don't i don't uh i don't believe that the lights just go out i believe that the the soul goes and oh, watches over, watches over us, and so that the going to mass every day uh, helped me out. Now I got to talk to Chris, talk to my dad, you know, and we uh, it, it was uh, that's how I got through. That's how I got through it. Mm-hmm. A little bit of counseling, of course, and there's you know there's always a few. Uh, <laughs> everyone goes, hey, you better go see somebody. And I go, huh. <laughs> I do. I need to see somebody. I think I probably do. Okay. 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 So we found a therapist because uh, uh, you can't, uh, that's a little too much um, shock and awe uh, to open up an apartment building. And then a year later, 
help my dad out. And my dad happened to be that that night he had fallen. So his kidney ruptured. And so he had to, uh, he, they couldn't fix his kidney. So they had to just slowly let him go with morphine and things like that. And he kept calling for me and they all go, Oh, you got to go, Johnny. I'm like, well, oh, what's happening? Why me? Why do I have to have these? Uh, so, but I, it was all right. Uh, I, it was great to be with dad. And then, um, with Chris, so they all looked at me like my situations are always were a little more uh, advanced as far as finding bodies and dealing with death. Uh, but we all went through it. Mm -hmm. I had to go through the council. Yeah. Yeah. Garan, you began the film by um, asking, what is grief? Did the answer surprise you? Um. Yes. So when I, when we started, um, the documentary, I had been just keeping a lot, I'd been keeping a notebook with me. I was writing all these things that I kind of wanted to touch on. And I remember it very early on thinking to myself, you can't define grief objectively. Can you <laughs> like, I mean, if you were to look up, you know, Miriam Webster's dictionary definition would say something like, deep loss, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it is that, but it's so much more than that too. So yeah. So it was important for me to, to ask people, um, I would say in the interviews, I'd say, I don't know if there's a definition, but if you were to put a definition on it, what, what does grief mean to you? Mm. And we, we got a variety of different answers. You know, the ones that surprised me the most, I think, were the people that said how physical it is, how mm. much of a full body experience it is, how much of a spiritual experience it can be. Those were very interesting to hear and to hear their, their reasons behind that. And yeah. I think at some part during uh, our production, James, my film partner, said, um, why don't we ask them the same question at, at, at the end of the interview, see if their definition definition has changed mm -hmm. because we had been, uh, most of these interviews ranged from, I mean, I think the shortest one was probably like 45 minutes, maybe an hour, but some of these interviews were hour, two hours mm. plus. So after talking about, uh, it for a while, I think some of us had different realizations throughout that process and and um, some of their definitions changed and some uh, were very staunch on their uh, answers and definitions. So it was interesting to see that spectrum there. Mm -hmm. And you didn't uh, record that at the end or did you? Did we I did. Miss? We yeah? did. Um, just the ones that you see in the in the film um, are, are from both. It could be from some of those ones that appear from the beginning and from the end. Oh, I see. That's how you did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't recall, John, if I saw your definition of grief. Did you share oh, one? It's, oh, it's in there. It's <laughs> in there. Grant, what did I say? John said grief is a B-I-T-C-H. <laughs> yes, it was. That's right. Oh, that's where that came from. <laughs> yes, that's what it is. It, uh, it, it, that it's, it's tough. I find um, it's, yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah. So you've got to, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, nobody wants it, but everybody gets it. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. Yeah. I remember uh, now. Thank you for reminding me. I remember seeing yeah. I just wanted to hear it in your words. <laughs> oh, you want it here? Grief is a bitch. You're right. Yeah. She, <laughs> it's a tough one. The documentary features really a diverse range of perspectives. Um, it talks a lot about all the different types of grief through the people that you interviewed. It starts off with rap. And I mm. thought that was pretty poignant. Um, he is, uh, um, I don't know if I remember him. I did see the show Rent. Mm. Um, and then from your grief expert, David Kessler, mm -hmm. what might you be able to share 
on how their stories and insights added depth to the film's narrative. Mm. Well, Anthony said something that I think, John, we were just talking, because John and I actually watched the film together the other night. Yeah. And um, yeah. There's, a, there's a part where Anthony says, um, you mourn the loss of your person, but you also mourn who you were to that person. Mm -hmm. And that goes with them. And I never thought about it in that way before. And I just felt like that was just such a powerful thing to realize because your identity as like a husband or brother, um, only that person knew you as that relationship to them. And so that does go with them. So you're also mourning a part of you, a part of who you were to them. And that's, that's really hard. Um, be, and it just kind of just deepens that notion that grief is so complex. There's, it's <laughs> like you're you're going through it and then you're like, oh my God, now there's this part of it too? <laughs> yeah. I, as you know, Anne, this is what I said in the beginning. Grant's got some very smart people on there. And like David, <laughs> uh, Anthony Rapp, uh, uh, David Kessler, Anthony Rapp, uh, they literally, just thinking of that aspect of, you, the person uh, who you were to that person is I'm like, oh, wow, you actually tried to tackle grief. Uh, I'm not going to try and tackle grief. I'm going to let grief uh, just stand there and be shake its fist at me. And I'll be like, oh, like a giant bully on a playground. I'm like, OK. Well, David, one of one of David's lines that that always makes everybody kind of jump back a little bit is when he says, um, you know, people will ask, how long is it going to take me to get through this? And he tells them, how long is the person going to be dead? Um, yeah, it's a doozy. And that's, that's, a, that's a real, that's a big one. That, that really makes yeah. you sit up, doesn't it? And pay attention that yeah. there's no pill. It's not going to be over in months. There's, I know people don't refer to them as stages anymore, but. I do like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's bringing us the languaging of them. Mm. But there's so many different parts, as you mentioned, who you were with that person is different as to who you're going to be with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And, John, with you losing yes. a brother, did you yeah. feel that part of you was missing? Oh, yeah. After, uh, yes. A part of me was missing after he was gone. It, it would be, yeah. Because it was, uh, you know, uh, Chris was a uh, powerhouse and, a, and, a, a, and so you could, well, I, when I started acting, uh, I tried to, <laughs> we, the Farley family aren't uh, trained classical actors. We just do whatever's. <laughs> uh whatever is uh whatever's in our heart and so uh how i how i started to learn i learned through chris and was wrong there is not two chris farley's there's only one chris farley which i've learned so people are like he's really loud and he's yelling and i'm like that's how my brother did it i figure and you can't do i define my own path in acting uh and so when he's gone it's like Oh, it's, it's, I wish, you know, I, I don't, I'm keep the journey going. And, uh, it would, I would love to have seen how Chris, we played off each other and, and, um, he learned from me and I learned from him how to find different characters and different meanings. And, and, uh, just, it was always a good laugh when you, you could hang out with Chris. And if we'd watch a movie, he could find the most obscure scene in the whole movie and we'd all laugh about it as to why it was in there. And it was, uh, so that was always fun to do. Um, I think it's worth mentioning too, that you guys do, you guys did have training. I mean, you had sec, uh, second city. Uh, oh yeah. Improv no, of course we did. Which is, which is very significant in the yes. acting world. <laughs> in the acting world, of course. Yes. We were trained through of improv, second city improv Olympic. We did 20 years of improv. So, uh, and still going on, still learning from improv. Um, but we certainly weren't the, the, uh, we didn't do the, 
our uh, classic uh, drama, our Shakespearean uh, dialect is still a work in progress. Okay, so you did <laughs> delve into the classics, did you? <laughs> In an uh, improv did. way or humor? In improv way, yes. There is a there is an activity in improv where uh, we have to be authors, and there'd always be some joke. I'd usually get Dr. Seuss, which I was quite happy with. But every once in a while, some joker in the audience would go, "Make him do Shakespeare." I was like, "Oh, why?" So I'd have to continue a story on in a Shakespearean uh, tone. Which was, uh, which was interesting. They all laughed at that because they knew I couldn't. You know, John will just do John will just do improv when we're just like at the store or out at a restaurant. Yeah, <laughs> I can't. Uh, yeah, and if I don't if know he's how going, I got a girl. Girls don't <laughs> like that because they're like, "Is this real? Are you being real? Who are you?" Nobody quite knows who we were. That's another dealing with grief. Is they don't know how to react to like, is he grieving or any? Uh, so but sorry they, about your brother. John, and I go, "What do you mean about my brother? He hasn't called in a while. Are you talking about Chris? Is, is there something wrong? I thought he was just being aloof." If John uh, goes over, maybe, if he goes over sixty seconds. Then I have to say, okay, he's 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 doing long form now. So yeah, yeah. we're we're in it. We're in it for a while. We're in it, are we? Okay. So yeah. change topics. I, I really appreciated your humor. And that really would catch people who are very uncomfortable when they know there's somebody has died and how to yes. approach that person. So that right. must have just totally thrown them off. Yes. Like, can I oh, I, that's where I was kind of trying to go with this. There's one girl out there uh, that Grant had on that I loved her. And it goes for me. I, if they want to, uh, if you want to help somebody that's grieving, tell them a great story of the person that has passed away. And that gets me every time. If I find a new, somebody has a new story of Chris, an adventure he went on that I didn't know about, I'd be like, oh, Please tell me that'll make me so happy. Yeah. And uh, as opposed to the person that just says, my condolences and moves yeah. on to the, what is you're going to be for the party after the funeral? I yeah, our, our, executive, the our executive producer, Lisa, uh, who's in the film, she says that too. She's, you know. Yeah, that was that who it was. It was Lisa. She said, "I want, I want people to say his name because he was here. He lived a life here." And um, yes, she says, "Tell me stories about him," you know. Um, and I think that's um, healthy. A lot of people are like afraid, uh, like to even say the name to the person, which is so strange. Like if I was afraid to say Chris's name to John in fear yeah. that I might upset John somehow. It's like, it's not like John's forgotten what happened. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He's, he, he's very aware, acutely aware of the, the situation. So I think it's, um, for me, at least it's nice when we have those conversations about, about Chris and John tells me old story. There's always a story that's funny. And, yeah. um, it just, it, it, it makes it feel so nice to, to, to have those, memories that you're able to share yeah that's to me is having somebody uh tackle grief a little bit for you you know manhandle grief a little bit uh put them in a headlock and say hey you know jack or gary or susan or margaret would have laughed at this uh open casket because you look at some of the people coming in here hey any old thing like that and just to be able to get a little chuckle or you know you, you don't have to go crazy with it but i mean just uh, I tell a cute little story, an old story or something funny. He always said this. Uh, that would uh, that's to me is is taking that grief blanket and uh, lifting it off a little bit for whoever is grieving. I think. Yeah, and um, that's a, a brilliant um, point that you both raise. People's discomfort around death and dying and grieving. Yeah. I don't know what to say to the person. Well. What's wrong with just saying that? <laughs> I yeah. don't know what to say to you. Oh my gosh, that's the best. If you can show that you're uncomfortable 
I don't know what I can say to you here. This is I don't know what to say. That makes it seem that'll that that's lightening the load for somebody. Yeah, because you know, I because they don't know what to say either. They're like I yeah. don't know what to yeah. do. Yeah, and yeah. then you'll often hear stories of their great aunt Maud coming out. Yeah. Of- as if that is going to be helpful but all of a sudden you've taken the it's their grief and all of a sudden they feel that they have to take care of your potential grief so it's very uncomfortable as well isn't it yeah you actually had uh, Grant a piece, a, a quite a lengthy piece of what uh, what some of the things people do say, mm-hmm. um, and what might be more supportive. Did any of those, when you heard them, surprise you? Did you find them? Of- uh, did they surprise me? Um, some of uh, what surprised me was how many people had the same answer, which was. Um, you know, the people that were just there, the people that didn't try and fix anything, Mm -hmm. you know, um, many people just wanted someone to just sit there and listen. Um, just knowing that someone else was there helped many people, I think. Um, and oftentimes, Mm -hmm. you know, people do want to talk about it and they just don't know how to open it up. And so, um, it's nice when people ask questions as opposed to just saying something like, let me know if you need anything because the griever has a million things on their mind. The last thing they want to do is, you know, delegate tasks to people. (laughs) Well, they're already in that grief brain. They're not, they can't access the processing part that could say, yeah, come over on Saturday, mow my lawn, go get my groceries or pick up the children. Yeah. But if you, you know, perhaps if you know, like the kids do need to be picked up on Tuesday at 3 p.m., maybe you can ask them in a more tangible way. Do you want the kids? Do you want me to pick up the kids at three on Tuesday? And then they can answer yes or no, rather than a generic, like, let me think of something for you to do. Right. Um, because yeah. I think or do I think you need yesterday. to have the kids picked up at three, and then you could say yes. You could say ah, oh, it sucks. Good luck with that too, and walk away. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Boy, you've got a lot on your plate. And then go sit down and wait for the buffet. That's another option. <laughs> no, it's not. And so, I'm you, sorry. You see, <laughs> Anne, John always likes to bring it back to comedy. I can <laughs> see that you did warn me. You did. We were in the side. No. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I so appreciated that I can't remember the the gal that mentioned the anticipatory grief as being something mm. she wished she'd known about. And anticipatory grief is a real part of grief when mm. you are with somebody who's got a terminal illness, you're going through the potential loss. You just don't have the end date. Yeah. And I don't recall if you got her to answer if how that would have helped her. Mm. Well, I, it was Julie, um, that said that. And, um, Julie's great. She said so many things that I, I quote today. Mm -hmm. Um, her, so Julie and I actually met in our grief. We both are grief, uh, certified grief educators. And we, but we met in that program. With David Kessler. Okay, and, that's how you know David. Oh. Yes. And um, she, yes, so she says in the film that she wishes she knew that. I, I don't, anticipatory grief is not something that's discussed often. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I don't, I don't recall if she's ha- mentioned how it helped her. I remember talking to Anthony about it too, because um, his mother was sick and dying. Um, and he, he said, you know, there was no, there was no pretending like she wasn't going to be with us. So there, there is that part of anticipatory grief where it's like, you, you do know it's going to happen, especially when it's something like a terminal illness. 
Um, and I think perhaps if I'm just taking a shot in the dark here, you know, David could explain it better, but I think it's like, if you don't know about anticipatory grief, you may just kind of be quote unquote, hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you might be even further let down when that doesn't happen. And I'm not saying there, you know, I, I do believe there's a lot in that goes into like positive thinking, but, um, and at the same time, nothing can really prepare you for when the, uh, 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 you know, the, the finality of, of, mm -hmm. of a person dying. Um, so that's, that's a tough one. You know, yeah. that's a tough one. I, I remember we dealt with that just recently with my, my uncle who was, who was sick and it was the same situation. Like it was just progressively getting worse. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was like, you know, what's it going to look like a week from now? What's it going to look like two weeks from now? You kind of had to prepare yourself in that way. Yeah. Um, and then on the flip side, Ju Julissa talks in the film about how there's such a stark contrast between something like that, where you kind of know it's coming. And then those just sudden losses, yeah. those sudden yeah. deaths. Um, so, I mean, like with John, like, I don't think they really knew, like, I, you didn't know that that was going to happen to Chris that night, you know? No, so, of course not. That's why uh, the, when you have the train analogy, it's, that was more of my dad, because we kind of knew it was, it was progressing. We had to get back to Wisconsin fast from California. But with Chris, it was more of a shock and awe boom, which, uh, so, which is pretty much the way he lived his life, shock and awe. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. The reason I, I bring that up is I had one guest on the show whose daughter was, um, they knew she wouldn't live mm. much beyond mm. her second or third birthday. And she felt that by going through the anticipatory grief, she'd obviously been told about it, that she would get a get out of jail free card but then when her daughter died and the grief did visit it knocked her to her knees so it kind of blew that myth out of the water that it was a get out of jail free card mm. so i wasn't too sure what um julie's response or, or was but i liked your answer well and and yeah. grief changes too it's going to be different as you you know, as you move forward through your life, it's the uh, one thing Cynthia O'Neill says in the film is it, it doesn't stay the same. She yeah. says, I, I can't promise you anything, but a year from now, you're not going to feel the same sitting here as you are right now. And mm -hmm. that's, I, I, I think that's um, pretty accurate. And that's, I think, a comfort because when you're in grief in the initial stages, you think that this pain is going to be with you for the rest of your life, but it does soften and change, doesn't it? And it, I think yeah. you found that as well. And I think it's David that says something about um, facing the pain can help transform you. And well, that yeah, what, what we face, what we run from pursues us and what we face transforms us. Yeah. He got that from researching <laughs> buffaloes uh, when he was writing his book and he said that um buffaloes run when there's a storm mm. they run towards the storm to minimize the amount of time that they're in it okay and if they're oh. running from it it's going to keep chasing them so that's where it comes wow from. very so smart man i thought that was interesting yeah. I'm pretty yes. sure it's buffaloes. <laughs> I could be wrong. We have to read the book. Grant. <laughs> uh, it could be cats. Uh, one of the two. <laughs> Buffalo or cats. I wasn't sure who was going to show up. I thought it was just going to be Grant because I had sort of prepared some of the things that I found really, really helpful. And I think I've already mentioned it, that John Farley's statement. Um, uh, yes. About you making the dead feel bad. By not wanting to make them feel bad, you right. to bring Chris in and continue to tell jokes. To I yeah, guess. we have a people pleasing situation. Uh, uh, that's our 
that's our we that's our motive operanda is we like to please people so we even like to please the dead and so we we always uh giggle and laugh at uh nani or chris and then kevin <clears throat> or the kevin put it to like what are we doing here are we is is there like is it is it just a hilton hotel up there and they're like when we get up to heaven they're gonna be like whoa you should see what your brother did boy oh boy your dad can't find him. He's really mad. He didn't come home, and he took the car. There's a cars up in heaven. Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, we just we have a feeling that it, uh, they are giggling and laughing at all the silly stuff we do. And um, I kind of get that when I when because I don't know what I'm being. As Grant says, he sees me they, when I go out with people. They, they don't real. Um, I don't see it. But my kids see it, and they're like, "Oh my God, Dad just tried to talk to the Samson uh, phone, uh, the AT and T phone people about a Samson. He doesn't know what he's doing, and they just love to watch me interact. So I'm sure they're up in heaven watching me interact with trying to navigate life and laughing a little bit." <laughs> okay, yeah, I just wanted to bring that in because I really appreciated you you sharing that. Sure. Laughter is part of the journey and it's okay to laugh, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. But you're also, the, you know, you can't avoid the crying, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so have a good have a good cry and then have a darn good laugh afterwards. <laughs> that's true. That's how you do it. Yeah. I'll share Thank with you. you a little humor that I came across. Um, you might appreciate it. I'll just take a few minutes. I got into this. It was the death of my dad. And being a mm. nurse, I kind of figured, oh, I've got this all sorted out. Unfortunately, I was okay with death, but they don't teach you about the emotional components. So here I am, dad's executor, and we totally rearrange his uh, funeral and he is going to have an open casket and he's going to be buried. And I rush up, mom and I get all the clothes that he's going to be buried in. And I arrive at the funeral place and I'm sitting in the car doing a mental check of all the clothes. And I realize that I don't have his underwear. And in that split moment, oh. I suddenly thought, oh, my goodness, my dad's going to be flying commando. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious uh, well, i that's thought it funny. was i had to sit oh, there yeah. five minutes before going in yeah in funeral place and they were like <laughs> they were like penguins and made me feel guilt like you've no, no idea i swear <laughs> i was in therapy for a while anyway i just oh, wanted yeah. to share that was my humor very very early on so i learned that it was a after I got over the guilt, that it was a good thing. Anyway, yeah. we haven't spoken much about Dr. Marasco. Mm -hmm. And um, the piece that, that I took from his interview was, I thought this was profound. Do you only want the person to be a sad story or mm. can you find a way to enjoy that, that person? What? What were your thoughts when you heard him say that? I I agree with that very, very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of goes along the lines with what John says. I mean, when we talk about Chris, um, it's not just sad. We talk about these really funny memories, um, these really funny things that he used to do. Uh, when I talk about my uncle, you know, we talk about the jokes he used to tell. Mm -hmm. Um, so because they're, you know, our person, that wasn't all they were, you know, the event of their death doesn't define who they were in their life necessarily. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so there was so much more to that person and to us, um, in that relationship. And I think we want to remember those good parts of our relationship. Of course, it's, of course, it's sad that they're gone. Of course, there's no denying that. Um, but if we can find a way to hold space for both the grief and the gratitude of that relationship, mm -hmm. um, it can be profoundly helpful. Yeah. Both 
and or it doesn't have to be this or that does it right right coming to a close i hope you're uh warming up your vocal cords there grant for us uh, uh, yes <laughs> <laughs> you have created to me a beautiful masterpiece and i'm thrilled to share it with the community that i know uh, here in Canada, because to me, that's the only way we can get more people comfortable talking mm. about it. And it actually received a critical acclaim at the Dances with Film Festival. Mm -hmm. It was oh, yeah. Audience Award and Best Documentary. Did that surprise you, Grant? It, it, um, it did. I will say I was... Um, very elated. I um, was not expecting that. I was just sitting, we, we were all just sitting there watching the awards and thinking, oh, I wonder who that's going to go to. And then I heard our name called and uh, it was so surreal, you know, because the audience award, that's the one that, you know, the people vote on. Yeah. And yeah. So, so that means the people that saw it loved it. Um, and that made us feel really good. Mm. like we were doing something yeah. right were you there it, with them that night as well i was it yeah. was up against a, a marijuana uh legalizing <laughs> uh movie and we beat them how about that <laughs> good for you Not too grief shabby. And marijuana yeah Whoa. people care more about uh, grief than they do about marijuana so that <laughs> good job grant <laughs> bravo for sure yes Grant first, what do you hope that people can take away? What do you think will resonate with them? I want people to realize that so many situations in our lives are so much more nuanced than we think they are. Um, and that if we have these sort of longer form conversations with people, um, that's where you can really learn about you know, yourself and about others. Um, and furthermore that, you know, to me, it's like, it's kind of the one thing grief is the one thing that is like, it's universal and we're all connected through it. Mm -hmm. And so maybe some of those other like trivial things that we're always fighting about can kind of die down a bit when we realize that we are all humans having a human experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think Ju Julie is the one that, the one that said that in the film, um, that that surprised her how how connected we all are as humans through something like grief. Yeah. So yeah, I just I just think you know if people slowed down a bit and took time to just be a little more curious, you know, why do you feel that way? What makes you say that? What um, why do you not want to do this or that? There's always reasons if we um, open ourselves up a little bit more. Yeah. Absolutely. What about you, John? What do you what would you like or our listeners to take away? Well, I would have to say that uh no matter your uh, financial status, your mental status, your wherever you are in the world, uh you're if you're an introvert or an extrovert, uh However, you're grieving is the correct way, unless, of course, you're going around and trying to be a vigilante and fighting crime at night or something, something that's going to put you in danger. Let's not do that, people. But as long as you're dealing with grief in some way, shape and form, uh, then you're on the right track. So don't think of yourself as uh, and don't think you're alone. Don't think uh, this hasn't happened to you. Uh, I want you guys to take away that uh, everyone's in it together and everyone wants, everyone everyone has your back. As we like to say in improv, before we go out on improv, I got your back. And so uh, everyone uh, needs to know that uh, everyone's rooting for you and misses, uh, maybe not in the same hardcore way that you miss, the whoever passed away but in their own way they miss sometimes more i've gotten a few letters about uh, chris and i'm like oh boy you really uh 
And there's like a giant tattoo of him on his back. I'm like, oh, or I'm like, you, I did, wouldn't have gone that far. I like the kid, but I don't know. I'm just kidding. I love Chris. Yeah. Uh, but I would, uh, I would just say where everyone's in it together. That's what I wanted to take away and listen to some of Grant's, uh, some of the smart speakers and laugh at mine. But some of the smart, uh, some of the smart people he interviewed really have got. They took on that dark demon grief and was like, huh, maybe I can figure out why you're so grievy grief. I don't know. Well, maybe you're so, why are you so sad grief? I'll figure this out. Like uh, David Kessler and uh, Anthony Rapp. I'm like, uh, it's crazy. And I like the guy that the, uh, who was the guy with the beard, uh, uh, Grant? Ron? He was in New York, I think. It looked- <laughs> yeah, that was Ron. Right. He was in New York. He was a tie and coat. Ron, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I love the couple, the cute uh, older couple that uh, uh, the mom had the red hair and the and the older father that those two are adorable. And, uh, and the, you know, it's the uh, they're listening to how they, they grieved. It's tough. They're tough stuff. Yeah. 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 There was lots in the, the film, wasn't there? Their daughter was murdered. And yes. Yeah. And I got to see at that premiere that you were talking about, uh, the the guy who's uh, who's uh, got in the car accident coming home from church and his is, is, is but they donated their organs to yeah. carry on their legacy. And he was wasn't he there, Grant? He was the there, guy yeah. that received yeah. the heart. Her- Herman. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he was at the goodness. premiere. That's yeah. amazing. And I was, I was, that was his, uh, that was his son. That was his son. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was there, but the guy yeah. that donated the heart wasn't there. Right. Or was he there? I yeah. can't remember. No, no, he wasn't there, but, but I didn't think but, so, but no. he told the story of it, of all the organs that went out to people. Right, and right. it's Just shocking so- that nobody yeah. wanted Christopher's organs. I don't know why. <laughs> Just kidding. No, uh, that was a little, uh, uh, but, um, they, uh, it was an amazing story of of how their legacy can carry on, and why it's something I I couldn't I couldn't fathom really of of yeah it must be a joy it must be to see that your heart the boy's heart or the something you made with a a child or or a father it doesn't you know but uh, is carrying on and and keeping somebody else alive is amazing yeah, yeah. that's what I found so. Um, beautiful that you included yeah. not just the death. Well, there were deaths and griefs from them. Yeah. You included a whole variety of people's losses. And organ donation is one that I hadn't considered the type of grief. You're grieving your person, and there's yeah. the medical profession asking very lovely if you would donate uh, that to me. I cannot imagine the grief. Mm. Like it's two things you want to help somebody else, mm-hmm. but yeah. their, their child gets to live while yours doesn't. So it's a right. whole other complicated grief, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's really tough. Um, and I, I knew I wanted to have those stories in there to show um sort of how people can make meaning through loss. Um so it was important it was important for me to to include uh include those those stories in there. Yeah. Um, Cuz like you said I think it's oftentimes that's a part about grief that we don't think about. Exactly. Yeah. Well, before I fall down yet another rabbit hole, I want to thank you both for being here. Thank you. And our listeners for for spending time with us. I hope through these questions, we've helped demystify grief a little further for you and given you glimpses into behind the scenes of Meet Me Where I Am. And uh, I believe the film is now readily available. So yes, it's available um, on uh, on Apple TV, um, uh, Amazon Prime Video, um, Google Play. You can purchase the DVD on uh, Amazon. I just got it the other day. <laughs> DVD? So, I know. I have a Betamax, Grant. Do you still sell those or a VHS yeah. tapes? 
Yeah, they're hey, on beta it's, and VHS. Uh, yeah. I'm not really a big technology fan, but I I really appreciate that. No, he showed me the DVD the other night, and he goes, we got the DVDs. I'm like, I don't think anyone has DVD players anymore, <laughs> Grant, but that's great. Well, perhaps officiados do, who I don't sure. know if it's the, the purest. Like, some people still have the big LPs, don't they? Oh, that's true. Oh, yes. yeah, they're, they they're come, they'll come back. Yeah. yeah. Well, I will make sure whatever, wherever you can find it will be in the show notes. And I want to thank yes. you for uh, trusting me with you, with your wonderful story and you. um, the beautiful film that you've all helped create. You must be exceedingly proud of yourself. It's been a wild ride. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and I'm very happy that it's out in the world. I just want people to see it. You know, I want people to see it. I want people to talk about it. I and and you know, ultimately, I want people to to walk out saying to themselves, oh, I never thought of it that way. Or now I know what I can do. Or now I know how I can help my friends and my loved ones. So I, I hope that I hope that's, you know, what what this film can do for others. Well, congratulations to you, to John and to the entire cast that were brave enough to sit there and share their grief mm. with you with the lights yeah. and the producer and the film action and let's go people <laughs> yeah he forced me and he wouldn't stop until i actually said something meaningful no john we won't stop rolling until you say something that's heartfelt i'm like all right oh, uh, so uh, but he was great he did it he, he told stories like you, uh, or he asked questions like you, Anne, very, uh, in, he, he thought of the other person's feelings when they asked, and uh, it came across at how genuine you and both Grant are when you ask your questions. So glad you, you help people open up. Yeah, for sure. Well, I don't want to let you guys go. We, we should have an after <laughs> chat party. <laughs> We certainly could. I have children and I have to pick them up. School's almost out. It's three o'clock. Oh, no. Yeah. And are you going to honor us with just a few bars? I would love to oh, hear yes. your Grant, For the listeners out there, Grant was just in Beauty and the Beast. He's going to be in Mean Girls, is it, coming up, Grant? Um, uh, Legally Blonde. I'm sorry, Legally Blonde. Yes. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Yes. How exciting. I really, yes, I played the Beast in Beauty and the Beast uh, at um, Opera the San Luis Obispo Opera. Um, and it was an amazing, amazing experience. So, yes. Um, I'm not one for singing a cappella, but um, let's see. Let's see if I'm, because I'm not never in the right key, but um, let's see. I don't even know what a key is, and I sang with them once. <laughs> I had to do a show. Part of my okay, song. Well, you and I are going to hum, okay? We'll hum yes. Along. You guys, we'll hum along. We'll support uh, you. Oh, beauty could move me. That's a no tough one. Oh, goodness improve me. No power on earth if I can't love her. I'm all over the place in that, so that's all we're going to get for today. That was amazing, Grant. <laughs> yes, bravo. bravo. <laughs> yes. Thank you for, for doing that for us. You go on my Instagram to see more of me singing. That's where it is. Oh, yes. Huh? Come for the grief, stay for the music. There you go, Grant. <laughs> okay, come for the grief, stay stay for the music. Pleasure meeting both of you. Thank you so, so very much for spending thank time. Thank you, here. Anne. You're so welcome. Thank Bye. you, thank you. Ciao. Bye-bye. Uh, well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at Anne at Understanding Grief. Dot com, or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>